I am Dr. Dirk Lee. It's my pleasure to once again uh, interview Dr. Per Trobisch, who is the Chief of Spine Surgery at Eiffel Clinic St. Brigida in Simrath, Germany. Dr. Trobisch specializes in complex spine surgery for patients of all ages, pediatric and adult. His treatments include operations for scoliosis, kyphosis, severe degenerative changes, fractures, and unsuccessful previous operations. Dr. Trobers has an enormous amount of experience with uh, vertebral body tethering, which is a non-fusion scoliosis uh, surgery in both immature and mature spines. Today, he's going to share his vast experience uh, gained after tethering over 500 scoliosis curves, including lessons learned and the evolution of advanced techniques. Dr. Trobers, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Derek. It's great to be back. I believe it's... Uh probably two years or so, or even more than two years since we had our first discussion on VBT. And I think a, a lot has changed or it's better to say evolved. And we learned so much. We learned um, uh, a lot when VBT is great, but we also learned the hard way when it was not so great. Um, and uh, happy to share our experience with you. So maybe you remember the last time we talked, I showed you um, that um, my approach to VBT was um, not only based on skeletal maturity, but also based on how much can a patient benefit from a non-fusion technology compared to the standard, which is a fusion. So and I, I, I told you that time um, that we have defined different curve types. And this is a schematic drawing of these curve types. And in the other interview that we have together, I, I showed you a few x-rays. So it, it still holds strong, and I believe it helps us so much in, in screening patients. So just a short um, summary on this. These are all different curve types, and these are different kinds of scoliosis that we see in our practice. And we have the feeling that these types cover pretty much all curve types that are out there. Maybe there are very few exceptions, but pretty much every patient that comes into our practice um, can be categorized in one of these five types. So on the left side, you see a lumbar curve. So going down very close to the, to the sacrum, so the, the lower part of the spine. Uh, and then uh, the curve type changes. And let me just repeat our philosophy on this, um, always compared to the standard treatment. On the left side, this patient, uh, the standard treatment for a severe curve type like this would be a spinal fusion. And spinal fusion, I'm not uh, at all against spinal fusion. I actually do many more spinal fusions than VBT cases. Spinal fusion can be great, uh, but this patient would need a spinal fusion of the lumbar spine, or at least going into the lumbar spine. And um, we can stop scoliosis, we can correct scoliosis, but we do limit flexibility if we fuse the lumbar spine, and we do accelerate um, degeneration in the lower lumbar spine that is not fused. So um, it has more stress on the levels that are not fused. So in this case, we say it's definitely worse discussing VBT. Um, so we, this is the first screening tool. And then after that, we check for flexibility and maturity and, and all these other important parameters. But first we check the curve type. The second one also has a lumbar curve. So it's the same benefit um, that the patient would have but the patient also had a thoracic curve. So it's an S-shaped curve. And you see that, that the middle of the curves, we call it the apex, deviates from the midline. And these midlines you see in these uh, black lines. So in this patient, we found that selective VBT will not work very well in our experience. So selective VBT means you have an S-shaped curve and you only operate one curve of this S-shaped curve. It's a common practice for fusion, but we found that VBT acts differently than fusion. And if we have someone with an S-shaped curve, we recommend to do both curves. So same benefit, but more surgery um, because you have to do both curves. So you have to flip the patient. We do it one uh, in a single stage. So we did it on the same day, but it's still, you know, you have to deflate both lungs. It's just more surgery. And then the rest are thoracic curves, all the, the three on the right, the, the, the one in the middle, our type three is a long thoracic curve. And the next one type for the short thoracic curve. So um, these are different curve types. The long thoracic curve is usually more flexible and has a, a lot of motion in the thoracolumbar junction. So the, the junction between the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. And, um, and I don't have any 
the evidence on this, but I believe those with the long thoracic curve, they often have a what we call a trunk shift, so a very severe asymmetry of the body, and it's a cosmetic problem, but they also have pain because they have to rebalance their spine all the time. Um, so this is completely different than the, the type 4 as short thoracic curve. Um, the type 3 is an is a, is a intermediate candidate, I would say. The fusion would usually go down to L2, so somewhere in the, in the upper part of the lumbar spine, which brings um, a nice outcome. Um, but this patient would also benefit from VBT if all the other parameters are okay. Um, the short thoracic curve, the type 4, um, would only require um, a fusion in the thoracic spine. So we don't even touch the lumbar spine. And um, many, many patients don't believe that, but there's very limited um, flexibility in the thoracic spine. You even have the, you know, the chest bone. It's, it's also a fusion of the thoracic spine just in the front. So you cannot move your chest bone. Um, so this patient actually, um, we, we go for fusion, um, which is really interesting because this curve type is the one that's the best analyzed curve type. So the FDA study criteria uh, is on linky one curves. Um, and the FDA approval, actually FDA approval, I believe is a little bit wider now, but some, some implants in, in Europe only have approval for this curve type, for lanky one curves. Lanky one is a different, or lanky is a different classification um, that we used for fusions and that we don't use for VBT actually, but it's a, it's a thoracic curve. So in these curves, we consider a patient a candidate for VBT only if they, they have perfect other parameters, very flexible, a lot of growth maturation, uh, a lot of growth uh, ahead of them. Um, so we rarely do VBT for this these curve types. And the one on the on the far right, our type five, has also an S-shaped curve, but the S is only in the thoracic spine. So the main curve is in the in the mid thoracic spine, and the second curve is in the higher thoracic spine. So technically, it's not possible to do VBT for the higher curve because the shoulder is in the way. Um, so you would only have to do VBT for the main curve, but that will result in a shoulder elevation if you only operate the main curve and not the upper one. So this one, type 5, if he comes to our practice, we say no from the beginning. We don't even have to check for flexibility and, and all the others. And this is just our approach. I know that there are other surgeons um, who have different views on that. Uh, for example, some surgeons do selective VBT. Uh, and some of them have uh, nice results. Some surgeons do, for example, for the type 5, do a VBT plus a fusion. So it's called a hybrid, as you know. Hybrid, as you know. Um, one kind of hybrid is that. Uh, so it's just our approach, and it works for us. It works very well in our hands. Do you have any questions on that? Do you, do you, do you understand that? I mean, we discussed that before. Sure. I, I do have a quick question. With a lot of the... Uh... The progression of scoliosis, especially in the thoracic spine, uh, you have a lot of um, the thoracic kyphosis goes into hypokyphosis and oftentimes to lower doses. Is that, do you find that uh, with VBT in the thoracic spine, it just doesn't correct as consistently in terms of improving kyphosis in those areas? And that's why. Uh, selective thoracic fusion in those areas tends to be a bit more of a preferred option. So, um, so we don't indicate VBT for um, kyphosis, hypokyphosis, or what we call the sagittal parameters, but we check them, of course. So if someone, for example, is far off one side or the other, then it's probably not a good patient. If he has a severe thoracic low doses, it's probably not a good patient, but also severe thoracic kyphosis. Um, but then, uh, if they're kind of, they have a, an in the normal range, um, we don't focus on that so much. And we, uh, we published a study on, uh, sagittal parameters and we found, um, even though we don't really address it with VBT, they improve, or at least many of them don't get worse, but many actually really improve after surgery, which is a nice side effect. And we believe it's because of so-called reciprocal changes. So if you if you correct one plane, it's a three-dimensional deformity, then the other three uh, planes will also correct to some amount, maybe not fully. So at least we don't make things much worse. Um, but if someone is very bad already, we don't do VBT for them. But if someone is some, uh, 
normal uh, or in uh, maybe within some some acceptable um, you know variation of normal then um uh, we go for we can go for bbt this was our idea yeah so this is how we approached patients but now after a few years and a few hundred patients and a few uh, even more hundred curves because many of them have a type 2 so a double curve and we operated both curves then we um, learned that reality is not always how we wished it to be so um and if you if you agree then i can just show you a few case examples that are pretty much representative for our learning curve remember um this table a little bit and today i will only talk about the our ideal candidate so the type 1 on the left side, because we believe this is where we need really need to focus on research. Um, we know many things about the thoracic curves now. We actually know don't know much about lumbar curves. Yeah, very few studies out there that comment on lumbar curves. Um, so I will share my own experience and a little bit on the type two, so which is also a lumbar curve plus a thoracic curve. So this is a, a an example patient. So we have a lumbar curve. Uh, which is um, more than 60 degrees. As you can see here on the side, on a, it's a normal sagittal profile. I can tell you that even without showing you any numbers, but it's a normal sagittal profile. Uh, the third x-ray shows the flexibility and it's a really flexible patient. And, and then we, we have uh, the hand x-ray, which is acceptable maturity status. So the patient um, will um, is not mature yet. Still, it's not, not in the growth spurt anymore past the growth spurt, but still still okay. And um, in terms of growth modulation, um, I have a little bit different view in the lumbar spine than in the thoracic spine. I'm happy to discuss that later on. So anyway, this is a patient and the standard treatment um, would be a spinal fusion that goes to the lower lumbar spine. There are discussions, you can fill whole meetings with the discussions on where to stop the fusion. Some would say you go to L, L3. Um, L3 is the level where I have the lower measurement line. So um, on the left side, some would say the standard training would actually say you have to go to L4, so one below. And why are we discussing that? Why do we discuss stopping at L3, uh, even though we know that it will bring an inferior outcome because we want to save levels, because we want to protect the lumbar spine and allow flexibility? This is the same discussion that we have with, BB, have with VBT. But anyway, this patient, you would have to go to L3 or L4, which is past the middle of the lumbar spine. And the patient can still you know, be active, um, can, uh, can daily activities, maybe, some, maybe even some competitive sports, but not everything. You know, uh, gymnastics is probably done. Um, you know, all kind of trampoline is probably not a good idea. Um, so um, and and then also they 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 don't have a physiologic motion, so and they're a little bit stiffer, and also they have a higher risk for de 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 uh, degeneration in the future at L5, S1, or L4, 5. So this patient we thought great case for VBT. Uh, this was a few years ago. Flexible, immature, lower curve. So we did VBT and it looks actually really nice. So this is the first X-ray. We did a, a few screws. We stopped at S3 and I think T10. We improved the curve um, um, already. It's below 20 degrees, so it's 17 degrees, which is, um, which is uh, let me calculate, but it's uh, probably somewhere 70, between 60 and 70% correction, which is really nice. And the patient was not mature. So we said, yeah, the patient, when this patient grows, will even be straighter. Uh, but even if not, even if it stays there, perfect. Um, one year later, this patient did not continue to correct, but lost correction. So uh, now it's at 30 degrees. 30 degrees is still more than 50% corrections compared to the first x-ray. And if you look at the fusion data, if you look at the study out, studies out there, 50% 50, 50 correction is, in many studies is what surgeons can achieve with a fusion. So our outcome was comparable to, comparable to a fusion, but not fused, which is acceptable. It's not as good as we had it right after surgery, but it's acceptable. Not sure if you can see it. Do you actually see my like my mouse moving? So mm -hmm. it seems like there's a breakage. These screws are parallel, and there seems seem to be a little bit opening 
between these screw heads. So probably a breakage. So the patient broke the tether, but still is more than 50% better than before surgery. So it's nice to see. And then at two years, uh, the quality is not great um, because they only sent me the, this x-ray. Uh, at two years, there's, um, it's still within the measurement error, but it's still around 30, um, 30 degrees. Although there seems seem to be another breakage here. These screws are parallel, so the second and the third screw. And there's a little bit of opening. Not as much, but you can see it a little bit. So probably two breakages already. Um, and then, so it's actually not that bad. So then we have another x-ray, which is four years after surgery. And then um, now the patient's at 35 degrees. So it's less than 50% correction. And you can also see the patient is shifting to the side. Um, and um, not sure if there's another break. It's maybe the top two screws. They were, the heads were closer together here and then now parallel here. So maybe there's another breakage. So at least three breakages. Um, but it's, you know, 35 degree. It's still good. It's still nice. Better than to have a fused spine. But um, and 35 degrees, if someone kind of comes in in my practice with a 35 degree x-ray as scoliosis, I usually don't recommend any fusion. Um, so it's okay, but it would be nicer to have it better, to have it straighter. So, and then um, you maybe know that um, Surgeons are discussing uh, for many years, what if we put in two tethers? Is it better? Uh, do we have more durability of the, of the tether? And I'm not sure if you're aware, but we published a paper uh, where we showed that um, if the tether breaks early, it's not so nice for the curve. The curve can get worse, but if the tether breaks late, it's probably okay. So the, the negative impact on the curve behavior is less if the tether breaks later. So we don't expect the tether to hold a lifelong, but maybe until after skeletal maturity, maybe a little bit longer. So um, can two tethers work better than one tether? Can I fire a quick question to you? Um, sure. I was, I was looking at a recent study um, in terms of the tether breakage, and it was indicating that um, it seems to be at the screw tether interface that um, that seems to be the, the weakest point. In your surgeries, or if you have had revisions, have you noticed that that tends to be where the breakage is as opposed to being in the middle of the span of the tether? Yeah. So this is a great discussion and I, um, I will definitely get back to you later mm -hmm. because I have a nice photo and then I will explain on the photo um, because we really focus very hard on tether breakages. Um, and uh, which also uh, means that we actually do a few revisions and we analyze every broken tether exactly where it broke. And you, you may be surprised actually, but uh, I, I'll get back to that. Okay. So this is a time where no one really knows any answers. And whenever you have an idea, you have some doctors and patients who love your idea and you have some who don't love your idea. So of course, if we discuss two tethers, we make the thing stiffer. So, because two tethers are much stiffer than one tether. And then I understand that people will argue, why don't go for a fusion right away if you make it that stiff anyway? So we wanted to know the answer before we start. So we did biomechanical testing. Um, let me see if I have this. Oh, this is a sexual profile, by the way. This is what I mean. Uh, it, on, this, on the lateral view, it actually looks very nice, but I can skip this for now. So we did biomechanical testing that we published. This is, um, sounds a little bit weird, but these are actually cadaver spines. So these are donor, sp donor spines in the, our anatomy department uh, from the university hospital where I have an affiliation. So we used lumbar spines um, and put in, on the left side, you would see one tether. And then we put in two tethers, and we even what we call it, what we also call a hybrid surgery. Uh, use one tether and then an fusion in the middle of the curve because at that time uh, we believe that could be a future perspective. So, and we checked all the motions. Uh, we tracked with um, uh, with our engineers. Don't ask me the details. Um, with uh, ultrasound and and um, uh, and, and the computers and machines, we tested all motions, and we found that. Um, 
Um, there is, if you have one tether, it almost moves normal in terms of bending and stretching and in terms of rotation. It does not move more normal in terms of, uh, in terms of side bending, which is normal because they have a scoliosis. So we actually don't want it, want the spine to go back into the scoliosis. So the tether blocks that direction. And it also blocks the direction to the other way because then everyone would have an overcorrection in the side bending views. Um, so this is what we expected by 50%. The side bendings are decreased by 50%. But if we put a second tether, it's still the same flexibility. The reason may be that we don't tension the second tether as much, it's just a protecting tether, um, but we don't reduce flexibility with putting a second tether. And if we um, put a, a short rod in the middle of the curve, in addition to the one tether, um, then uh, we have some reduction, but not a 100% reduction of the instrumented area, but of the global range of motion, so the global, whatever, the lumbar spine, what we tested, um, if I remember right, was somewhere between 10 and 20% reduction, um, so which is still nice. So, so we tested that, and this, and then after that, we did uh, clinical um, uh, patients. So here's another girl, same curve type, lumbar curve, patient would need a fusion down to a three, um, uh, very flexible, almost overcorrecting on the bending curves, a little bit more mature. So she will, she's what we call center seven. She will not grow forever. She's, some would even call her mature already. So there's a, um, I don't think there's consensus on who is ma fully mature or not. Um, we know a little bit about growth spurt, um, rapid growth, slow growth. Um, we know a, most of what we know is on bones. We don't, we hardly know anything on disc maturation. Um, so in my eyes, this patient is not a fully grown adult because um, the hand is not fully fused. And uh, I believe there's still a little bit, there's still some maturation going in the, in the disc. So we did it two, um, two tethers. Um, it's hard to see here because the screws are right behind each other, but there, trust me, there are two tethers in there. And as we know, there will be breakage. We even overcorrected a little bit. So it's minus six degrees now. It's a little bit overcorrected. And then maybe if you, if you see it, there's some a little bit off balance. So the head is not perfectly centered over the pelvis, but we know the tether is gonna break. And at two years, the tether broke and she has a perfect balance as seen by the line coming from the head down to the pelvis. Now she is plus 10 or plus nine degrees. Um, so she comes from 41 degrees, is at nine degrees. So this is 75% correction, if I'm right, almost a little bit more. Um, in a non-fused spine after two years, and I expect, because she was a Sanderson, I expect that she is skeletally mature now. Um, she has a breakage. Um, not sure. So this, these are very parallel, so maybe here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even here, but it's hard to say. So, but it could be that there's a breakage, but she's perfectly balanced, has a nice sagittal profile, and um, and uh, and and a nice curve below ten degrees. We don't call it scoliosis if it's below ten degrees, right? It's mm -hmm. at least for un unfused, unoperated scoliosis. Mm -hmm. So, um, any questions on that, Derek? Yes. Well, <clears throat> I know some surgeons are kind of. Um because of the the relatively high rate of tether ruptures are um, experimenting a little bit with um, triple tethers, quad tethers. Do you have an opinion on, on those um, approaches? So um, there's a high rate and we need to have better implants. Um, so I'm sure the industry will provide better implants, um, but um, as long as we don't have them, we the idea was to put in more tethers. Um, so two tether is, I would say, common practice now for lumbar curves. I would say everyone, almost everyone who does lumbar curves um, puts two tethers, even though there's not even a, a publication on that. It's uh, crazy because surgeons talk to each other. So we meet at meetings and conferences. Um, three and four tethers, I think there's, handful less than a handful of surgeons um, who do that 
technically it's not that hard because that means you have two rows of screws and each screw has to grab two tethers. So that doesn't mean three, three or four tethers doesn't mean you have three or four rows of screws um, because that would be too much hardware. So uh, let's say in this patient, I have two rows of screws. So and each tether has uh, each screw, each row has one tether. So that would mean two tethers in each screw. Um, I think um, this is just very temporary. Um, we actually, uh, you're probably aware, we have uh, bigger tethers now. We started, started putting them in um, uh, half a year ago and they were, handling is great. I don't know the outcome yet. We will continue to analyze our data. Um, and with the two five millimeter tethers, uh, it's not possible to put them in the same screw anymore. We tried, but it's not possible, too big. With two four millimeter tethers, it's possible. But so I believe whoever does it, it's it, for the time, it may be good because it's stronger, but it's only temporarily after a while we will have better tethers. So it will not be a trend for the future. It's what I believe. Okay. Do you have any inside information on new tethers? Well, um, it's not really insight, I believe. So right now we have a stronger one. I, be I believe they will continue to improve the implant. Um, um, I, I'm not sure if, uh, if it's officially launched by the industry, but I believe so. Um, okay. yeah, so it's, uh, we don't have any you know, special contracts or we don't do any off-label tethers or so. Uh, it's just a matter of time until all the companies have a uh, stronger tethers. Yeah. So this is a great outcome, even though it's a breakage. And you have to understand it, and people have to understand that breakage is not failure. And you will be surprised um, of our data. We have a very high failure rate, and not failure, breakage rate, uh, but a very low failure rate. And the paper is about to be published in, uh, probably soon. Um, uh, so and then you can see all the details, but this is a good patient and we don't only have good patients. And let me explain that with my, on my next patient. This is a very bad curve. Um, so it's a 70 degree, 72 degree curve, um, a lot of trunk shift, huge rotation. So in the middle of this, of the curve, we almost have a lateral X-ray because it's almost a 90% rotation. Um, this patient needs a fusion down to L4. Um, I actually, so I have to explain that. This patient has six lumbar vertebrae. So if I call this, here's a rib. If I call this L1, some patients, have, some people just have six lumbar vertebrae. Then it's, then, oops. And this is L2, L3, L4, L5, L6. This patient needs a fusion down to L5. So would only have two discs. Same discussion, can we stop at L4? Maybe, but why should we ex why should we risk a worse outcome? Because to protect fusion, uh, to protect motion levels, it's always the same discussion. The fusion down to the lower lumbar spine in this curve is a salvage procedure in my eyes. You can always do that. So let's see if the patient's flexible. But unfortunately for me, great for the patient. Unfortunately for me, it is very flexible, the patient. So now, uh, now, it's really worth discussing VBT because why should I, why do I want to fuse a 16 year old girl uh, with a very flexible lumbar curve um, just because we don't have long-term studies. We do have long-term studies on fusion. And if you, if you fuse them to L4 in the long-term, they don't always have great outcome. So just because having long-term studies doesn't mean it's the best procedure out there. So we check for, um, maturity and this patient is not a hundred percent mature in my eyes, but it's very close to getting there. Um, and again, this maturity may be something else. Um, and um, I believe it, maturity happens later. And I believe this maturity is very important for um, for lumbar curves. So what we did, we tried double VBT, double tether VBT, as you can see here. We were not able to overcorrect, but at least we have a 21 degree correction, which is, um, it's not bad. You know, it's, um, um, I'm not that, not that fast, but it's 30, 60, is that more 60, almost 70% correction probably. Um, so it's nice. A year later, 
she lost correction. So the sagittal profile, by the way, looks great, but uh, the coronals or the, the view from the front, um, it's still okay. I mean, she has a non-fused spine and a 30 degree, 31 degree curve, which is more than 50% correction. Uh, and again, the fusion data says 50% correction for in many studies. So she has a non-fused spine, more than almost 60% correction, um, which is nice. And not sure if you see anything, but I don't see any huge changes between the screws. So I don't believe there's, there may not even be a breakage. Um, I may be wrong, but if we analyze in detail and we measure all the screws in detail and the angles, maybe there's some, but I believe it's some kind, maybe related to rotation, maybe. Um, so this is totally fine, but it doesn't stay like that. And the patient comes in two years after surgery. Actually, now some symptoms, not feeling really bad, but some symptoms. Um, just doesn't like the hip and the waist sticking out. And um, um, so... And um, now it's, we're at 50, almost 50 degrees, which is not great. So this is, this is a failure, I would say. Um, we have a breakage and a failure. So let's try to check. So without measuring angles in detail, but can you see and do you, do you believe that it's broken? And can you tell me maybe where? I mean, yes. you've seen so many x-rays. So help me with this, please, Derek. <laughs> I would say the last two screws, there seems to be a breakage there. Yeah. Between these two, Mike, you mean? Yes. I would say so too. How about here? Maybe not, right? Mm -hmm. Everything so I'm looks not sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we can close. measure it. Mm -hmm. So maybe, yes. So as you know, we don't really have good ways to diagnose breakage and rupture. Um, there is a rule if, it, if the screw changes by more than five degrees compared to the other x ray. Um, then it's a good sign, but we, we uh, tried to validate this rule and we found it's high uh, false uh, negative rate. So um, many breakages don't have changes of more than five degrees. We, we found that in our revisions. Um, let's go to here. This is what we call L12. So let's go to an old X-ray that was, would be here. Maybe, maybe not, it's hard to say. Um, this pretty much looks straight, right? If you look at the top four levels, maybe even five levels, at mm -hmm. least the top four levels. They mm -hmm. look very straight here compared to here. And then we uh, did the revision. And um, what we do with all the revisions, we analyze the tethers. And let's talk about this. So this is what we have. This is the posterior tether, the one in the back. This is the anterior tether. So you were right, the bottom was broken, both levels. Interestingly, the second one where we suggested some breakage, was partially broken here. There were a few fibers still attached and the anterior one was totally intact. And all the rest, there was not even a single scratch, it was completely intact. So, so this shows us many, many things. So first of all, and this is just an example, and we have uh, a, few more, uh, uh, a few more examples like this that we are analyzing right now. First of all, I believe the one in the back breaks first. And then the one in the front breaks second because it's the supporting yeah. one. Breaks first, then it came that. That was about to break. Mm -hmm. And maybe that would have been the next one. Mm -hmm. You understand? But it, mm -hmm. because this was still partially intact, this was also still intact. So, so I believe it breaks here, then there, then here, then there. This one, not even a single scratch, not even a single fiber that was broken. So I believe after two years, I believe after two years, probably fine, maybe successful tissue remodeling. And now to your question that you had before, these arrows show exactly on the level of the screw. So this one broke at the disc level. It was not close to the screw, same as this. So there are different implants out there. So I can only comment on the implant that I use. Um, most of the tether breakages don't break at a screw in tether implant uh, interface, but in our experience, they pretty much all break at um at the you know at uh, the disc where the patient where the patient moves where there's most motion. Hmm. We had initially we had a few that broke at the screw tether interface, um, but although I'm not an engineer, uh, I get some information. I believe 
this crew changed a little bit its crew profile um but don't uh, you know i may be wrong because i'm not uh, i don't you know i don't work for the industry and i'm not an engineer but I, that's what i heard that changed a little bit and we rarely see breakages on that screw interface it happens sometimes i cannot give you any any statistic on that but most of our, our breakages are here in the disk level and then also we see um which is a big discussion some believe it breaks at the apex first mm -hmm. um but not in our findings we find that it breaks breaks from more flexible to more rigid which means in the lumbar spine from the bottom up when we same in the thoracic spine let's say you have a few uh, tether from t5 to l1 t12 l1 would break first and then t10 11 uh, or t11 12 and then uh and then maybe from the other side but the apex probably the, what is it the latest area or maybe never but i still believe the apex is a little bit responsible because the apex is where there's rotation so if you have a lot of rotation at the apex here here it puts this area more on stress um because so this is just hypothesis i don't have any evidence for this but this is just my philosophy and you know i may be completely wrong but this is our approach right now so uh, we learn a lot from tether breakages um do you have any questions on this because i know you're very interested in breakages and ruptures and yeah i am because it it makes sense because um you at the lumbar level uh the more distal points you're there has to be more strain or, or more stress right it's almost like a um a hinge point um uh, but it's it, I, will, I was always thinking before with and just talking to other surgeons that it seems that it was the the uh, screw tether interface because of the pinching and the stresses that there at that point that it would make sense two different materials to uh, that's the contact point it's compressing and you'd have more wear and tear but it's pretty fascinating that you you've noticed that it's uh, happening at the disc where there's high flexibility and I guess and I just... believe that's actually the that's the huge difference between biomechanical testing and studies and real in vivo studies. Mm -hmm. Biomechanical testing, and I know these studies, and there's just a new one out there um, from Hong Kong. They have a different kind of motion in their biomechanical machines, like all the studies, and I did them myself. Um, that is not very similar to the motion that a patient has. So. Um, that may be the explanation why in the lab it breaks differently than in a, in a patient. Um, but this is just an observation from a few a few revisions. So um, again, I may be completely wrong. Um, some surgeons also believe, uh, or some some uh, researchers believe that elongation comes first before it breaks, which also makes sense at the disc level. So it stretches first. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think we we are in a very exciting time where we learn so much on the revisions. So I'll go back to that patient here. Going back all the way to the left. This is a failure, no, no question. But going back all the way to the left, um, this patient, let's say before tether in my practice, will probably had a posterior fusion from the back to from T4, so from the upper thoracic spine um, to L5 here. And maybe after a discussion, it's a shared decision, um, a fusion only to L4, again, six lumbar vertebrae. Mm -hmm. so, oops, sorry. So it's still a, it's still a 12 bones that are fused together, for example, with two metal rods. And some surgeons who consider a fusion from the front, it's very popular in Europe, not so much in the US, although I believe it's going to come back. So in, if you fuse from the front, you can save a few levels, but this is one that's not easy to fuse from the front. So, and then looking at this, it's really hard for me to say we have a failure after two years on one and a half levels, maybe let's say two levels. Why should I go for a 12 level fusion? So we changed a little bit our, our mind and our, our approach. So I said, let's fuse these two levels because these are the bad levels. The rest is totally fine. Look at these, perfect. No, no scratch and maybe it only holds for another few years but maybe maybe long so this is what we did we revised the patient and i don't know if you can see it there are white dots here and these are cages 
So we fused those two bad levels. It's a two-level fusion with a cage. The fusion with a cage is very popular in the adult population, degenerate population. It's done thousands of times every day in the world. Uh, it's because it's a nice, clean, uh, minimal invasive fusion. And then we exchange the tethers. And now we have even less strain on the tethers because there's no curve. Um, so if it was holding for two years here with two four millimeter tethers and not even a scratch and with some curve, why shouldn't it not hold longer if I have stronger tethers now and no curve? So that's my philosophy, but this is a very short term outcome. So I can tell you uh, about the long term, but this is uh, our approach on revision surgery right now. It's a second chance if you want to call it like that. Yeah. Ask a couple questions. <clears throat> sure. Okay. I love the idea because it seems um, you're. So, did you consciously focus on uh, fusing the levels where the tether ruptured because you suspect that's where uh, most of the strain is? Or is it as opposed to being at the curved apex, for instance? Yeah, so for the revision, um, uh, we, we, it was, again, was a shared decision with the patient. The patient did not want a 12 level fusion. And we said, just retethering will probably not work because it failed initially. So we have to do at least a partial fusion. So we were expecting two level fusion, uh, maybe more. And then we said, we have to check the tether. Where did it break? Uh, what, what was, uh, how is does it look intraoperatively? Uh, but we we stayed with our initial plan. It's just a two level fusion. Okay, I think. Uh, let me just re rephrase the question. So, did you uh, fuse the levels based upon where the tether ruptured, as opposed to fusing it at the curve apex because the apex seems to be higher? Yes, correct. So it's a very very individual uh, decision for this patient because we found the bad disc that was responsible. Uh, at the bottom, we said we want to get rid of the bad disc, whatever the disc that caused the failure. So that's for this patient, we fused the bottom. But your question is a perfect um, question for the next case that I have for you. So I'm going to show you that. This is a double curve. It's an 11 year old girl. Um, maturity is great, tender three. So this is what we believe a lot of growth modulation. Um, the, th the thoracic curve is 54 degrees and bends to 22 degrees, which is nice. So um, we believe it's good. But the lumbar curve is 59 degrees, but only bends to 41 degrees. So it's not flexible. So now you analyze this curve. Why does it not bend to bend better? And then if I measure only the angle at L12, the apex, there's still a 23, almost 24 degree angle. So now you can say the apex of 24 degrees is responsible for the bad flexibility. So if you subtract, it's a lot of mass today, sorry. <laughs> but if you subtract 24 degrees from 41 degrees, you actually have a pretty flexible lumbar curve, except for that one bad disc, which is really, it's not even opening here on the bending x-rays. So we have a nice thoracic bending. We have a nice lumbar bending, except for L12. We have a great skeletal maturity status. So one parameter does not fit, the others fit. Um, the, what's the standard? Standard is fusion to L4. It's always, you know, for some of these curves, it's fusion to L4, sometimes L3. It's the same discussion. Should we fuse to L4 or L3? Um, why do we do it to protect levels? So we said, let's just get rid of that bad disc here, L1, 2, and then we may have a better result. So this is what we do for these patients. We fuse L1, 2. You know, we by taking out that disc, which is similar to a disc release, but I'm not a friend of disc releases in the lumbar spine, especially not if I have to go to across the whole spine to the opposite side to detether. So I have to open up um, that sticky disc on the other side of the spine. So I have to take out the whole disc. And um, maybe a disc release could work, but I believe a fusion works great. So we put in that cage, so like a plastic thing that we put in there um, um, and it it opens up the opposite side. So where the spine is, is wedged the concave side. And because there's a cage, I believe it blocks uh, that 
that the spine can collapse again, that the disc space can collapse again because it's blocked. So now once we get rid of that cage, uh, oh, sorry, of that bad disc, we find a very flexible curve. So then we put our two tethers, top and bottom, and you see we try to be, even though it's Jesus Center 3, I'm not that afraid of overcorrection anymore um, because we rarely see it. Undercorrection is a bigger problem and, and breakages. So I go for a good correction. This is maybe, now she may have two 10 degree curves. I know she will lose a little bit at the beginning and then she can grow. Sergio profile looks good. Um, here you see that fusion, that cage. But once again, this is, um, this is a very new, it's not something that um, we really recommend um, because we have not analyzed our data. It's just the, the idea that we have from some patients now. We definitely make sure to collect the data and publish, even if the data is bad, we will publish the results uh, and we may recommend, uh, don't do that. Uh, we have bad results, but so far it looks promising. Yeah. Okay, a follow-up question. Sure. With the, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, with uh, when discs are replaced and those levels are fused, uh, they usually put uh, a rod, screws and rods there to stabilize the segment. You have really good confidence that the tethers will hold? So this is a great question. This is something that we strongly discuss with the, um, with the patient um, because it's, so a fusion of a disc, is not really, you know, um, an experiment. It's done all the time. A fusion of an apical disc in an immature patient um, may be a little bit more unknown. Um, uh, I wouldn't call it experimental. It should not be completely alone, so it needs additional fixation. Um, it's a big question. Do we need a really strong metal rod as additional fixation, or is the additional two big tethers as additional fixation? May that be enough? But it's something that we wait that we discuss with the family. And one risk is that the cage will not fuse to the spine. That's one risk. Um, on the other hand, we know that in the pediatric population, they have such a gr great bone healing. And if you make sure you take out the whole disc and the, and the cartilage, uh, and you have a very big cage if you come from the side, we feel confident that it fuses in, in the patients that we have already in a short-term outcome, so a few months follow-up. Um, we don't see any, any movement and motion of that cage, which is a sign that it's probably fusing. But uh, great question. We don't know for sure if that technique is, a, is the final answer. Okay. Well, I know there are um, quite a few viewers who probably want me to ask, uh, are you comfortable doing this with uh, more mature spines? Um, for uh, for lumbar curves, so our type one, maybe type two. Um, the final answer is, I believe, a long fusion with metal rods is a it's a salvage salvage procedure and can always be done. So that doesn't mean you can do VBT or AC or whatever you want to call it um, for everyone um, because. If you, if you have an expected high failure rate, it's also not a good idea. So we, and we believe it can be done in older um, adolescents who don't have a, have a, you know, who have not completed a skeletal maturity, which we see on x-rays. So up to center seven, um, we believe if you have older patients than center seven, you need a good, very good reason to do this. And maybe in combination with some cages, um, and um, so they need to be very flexible. They need to be very active. They maybe they they earn their money and they're living by dancing or something like that. Uh, and then uh, so it's still um, not experimental, but a very unknown uh, technique. So I would say as a general answer in our practice right now, up to center seven. So they still have to be some immature, uh, some immaturity. Yeah. Yeah. And that also actually brings us to the discussion that we had before. You asked me, do I do BBT or AC? I knew that this technique will evolve. And I, told, I showed you my first patient, five screws, one tether. So you can call that BBT. But now we have, I don't know how much, 16 screws or so, two tethers, one cage, and I still call it BBT. Because it's just, it's just an evolution of a technique. You know? But um, uh, there are different terms out there. And... Sometimes I call it ASC. It's just a non-fusion surgery. Yeah. 
fully understand. Would you ever um, do the cages with the uh, apical fusion for higher levels in the thoracic spine, or would you kind of limit it to the uh, thoracolumbar junction and below? So um, cages I don't do in the thoracic spine because the disc is so small, you cannot put in, you probably could, but you don't need to put in cages, but you can still a fusion in the thoracic spine. You just take out the disc and the cartilage, then you can do a fusion. Um, this is in the lumbar spine, we do it, that we don't, we don't want to risk kyphosing that segment. Uh, so that on the, on the side view that it is, you know, that uh, the patient's leaning forward after a while. And also, um, there's much more disc space in the lumbar spine. Um, and it's probably, this will probably be not fuse if you only take out the disc. So in the lumbar spine, we put cages in a thoracic nerve. Yeah, you mentioned before about the mat maturity of the, uh, the uh, lumbar discs and how it's not really well understood. And I believe from our previous talk of a couple of years ago, you mentioned that, um, you know, it's much more uh, hydrated, much more flexible in an adolescent. And as you get older, it becomes really more tough, more uh, uh, stiffer as well. How does that impact the surgeries? Yeah, so this is all hypothesis, and there's no good data out there. But let me explain why we have this hypothesis. So um, um, first of all, if you look at the lumbar scoliosis, there's not so much bone wedging compared to a thoracic scoliosis. So the, the scoliosis in the lumbar spine um, usually comes from disc wedging. So the bone looks actually almost normal, but the disc doesn't look normal. So that means you don't need so much bone modulation. And bone modulation comes from, from a lot of growth. So, um, so this is why we can accept doing VBT later for lumbar curves than for thoracic curves. For thoracic curves, they need a lot of growth. So you really need young, immature patients. Otherwise, we don't even do that. Um, but for lumbar curves, we can accept doing it a little bit later. So and then the next uh, reason for this hypothesis is if you operate pediatric and adult patients like we do, um, and also pediatric discs, for example, for anterior fusions, then after a while you see differences in that disc. Uh, pediatric disc, if you cut into a disc, it looks completely different than an adult disc. Um, so an adult disc is very solid, you know, very almost very stiff, and pediatric disc is, is, you know, almost looks like, not really like water, but almost like some, you cut into the annulus and it's almost some like some glue coming out there, some, some slime, something like that. Um, and what we found is that uh, it does not necessarily correlate with Sanders or RISA score. Sometimes we have someone with the RISA 5, Sanders 7 or Sanders 8, and we want to do a fusion and we cut into the disc and it still looks like a pediatric disc. Uh, and sometimes rarely, but sometimes we have someone with a Sanders four or five, we cut into the disc because we want to put a cage at the apex or a disc release, and it almost looks like an adult disc, but this is rare. Usually, um, even those patients where we believe they finish skeletal maturity, they even have disc tissue that looks like a pediatric disc. So I believe disc maturity comes a little bit later than, uh, um, you know, than bone maturity. Can't tell you when. And then the, the next reason for, for this hypothesis is Scoliosis develops in pediatric adults and patients. Um, you can have a straight spine when you're 11 and you can have a curved spine when you're 12. What you cannot have is straight spine when you're 20 and a curved spine when you're 25. That doesn't happen. So what you can have is a straight spine when you're 60 and a curved spine when you're 65. So somewhere between 20 and 60 years, a spine does not curve if it's straight from the beginning, but it curves in, uh, when they're adolescent and it curves um, uh, when they're older. In adolescents, we don't know the exact reason. We know it has to do with growth. Um, it is stable, uh, you know, when you're in, uh, between 20 and 60. And in the adult population and in the older population, we know it's because of degenerative changes. You know, they, they, this lose water. So our hypothesis is we combine all three theories together, try to have a straight spine when they're 20. So, and then hopefully it can stay until uh, mm -hmm. for a few decades until the de de degenerative changes happen and then it may curve back. But if they have a straight, 
some curved spine, not fused spine, it's probably a benefit for the patient. You notice that the, for severe curves, you notice that the, um, for instance, in that patient where you had to do the, uh, the apical fusion, this, is that disc that's under the most strain, the most wedging, is that physiologically different than the other discs? I think I cannot answer this question because we, you know, we try not to take normal discs. Mm -hmm. So uh, we take the, the apical disc, which, um, you know, to, to have a good answer, I would have to take all discs in this patient. Um, so I can't really compare in that individual patient. Yes, in, in, um, in some uh, of these patients where I take out the disc, it may look a little bit different than in another patient but I can't tell you if it looks different than another disc of the same patient. Okay. Very good. Now, but I actually believe in these children, and there's not much degeneration. They don't look degenerated like in a, in a 60 year old or so. Okay, so even if it's like an 80 degree curve at the disc at the apex, that's really wedge. It's still gonna be a healthy disc relative to the rest. But the disc can be healthy, but if, if on the bending side view, mm -hmm. the disc didn't even get parallel, there's no function of the disc anymore. So even if the tissue is healthy, it does not add to any flexibility or motion of the patient. So the segment may be um, you know, not normal anymore, even though the disc tissue is normal. So this is why, especially in those rigid apex, um, we feel optimistic that this could be an option for them fusing the apex. Excellent. Okay. Dr. Trovish, thanks for sharing your skills. I, it's, it's incredible that you've done over 500 tethers. Can't believe that. You started when you were 20, I think, with your surgeries. <laughs> and, Thank you very uh, much for having me. Yeah. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, moving into the future, uh, you, th you, do you, how do you feel in terms of this particular uh, process in terms of the apical fusion with the tethering? Do you think it, you've, do you think you've hit the kind of magic um, solution for for lumbar tethering i thought that so many times and i was wrong you know <laughs> doing lumbar tether i thought this is the way to go we will only do lumbar tethers in the future and i was proved wrong because uh, they broke too early then putting two together i thought that's the solution um and uh it's not the final solution so now we do one level fusion sometimes two level fusion it may work uh, but if uh you know uh, it may also result in a full fusion in the future. And we're back to where we were 20 years ago. Um, actually, back to where we were 40 years ago, doing only anterior fusions instead of posterior fusions. So, you know, a, it's really hard to say. But for now, we feel it's worth trying at least. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Trovish. I really you. appreciate your information and being able to share that with the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you.